I'm here with uh, uh, legendary audio designer, John Curl, and he is going to uh, run down some of his equipment that he uses in terms of designing, in terms of doing testing for uh, distortion, and he'll be more specific with that as we go along, I'm sure. Take Hi away. there. Yeah, uh, what we have here, and what I decided to show you, uh, is not exactly what was on in the uh, invite. Uh, I decided that a little tube amp, not a little tube amp, it's a pretty good size tube amp, to be honest with you. You know, it's like a, a Dynasterio 70 or or, uh, but you know, back in the old days, that's all the power we have was like 35 watts of channel. And this is what this little guy does. And um, I'm gonna show the distortion on it because it's a lot easier and clearer to see the distortion on a little amplifier like this. Even though the amplifier is in good shape, it, we tested all the tubes recently before, and we only found one bad tube, I found one, and then, Everything else is working just as well as brand new tubes. So there, it isn't a defective, when you see some distortion, it isn't because the amp is defective, it's just that it is what it is. And to be honest with you, sonically, it probably sounds just fine. It's just that we, the, the distortion measurements that we make are actually pretty big. And I'll try to show you what we do as a, to really test the quality rather than quantity. Measurement is like a quantity, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.0001. But that is not really the quality. That is just the quantity. So let me go and show you now. I'm going to turn on this little amplifier. I, it's, it's off now. It's been off. And it takes about a minute to warm it up. And I want to show you the screens that I have here. This screen here is only showing me the residual hum in the room. We're on the cords and cables that are actually these these cords and cables that that they're not doing anything they're just sitting in free space kind of like if you were unhooked a uh, connector and put you know you heard some buzz or hum that's basically what we're seeing there and that's all concentrated in one little corner which is below a thousand cycles but now we're we've got something up and you can see over here that we got two sine waves. Now the two sine waves, one of them is kind of bogus. The bottom one is right now bogus. But this shows me this meter over here has gone from zero, which it was originally, to almost peak output. That output is about a little under three volts. That's about one watt. One watt into eight ohms. That's all it needs. Now, when I switch this, turn this switch, you can see that this guy changed. In other words, watch again. See that? Just sine wave, and then all of a sudden you get this kind of funny looking double doubling wave. And that actually looks like when I push this button here, it will show me what it looks like. And it shows me a whole spectrum, a spectrum of things. In other words, that waveform on the bottom is being is exactly this waveform, just presented in a different way. The one is, this is time. This is like milliseconds per division and, and amplitude. And this is amplitude and frequency. So the, the, the both are important. And for really fine tuning, it's a lot easier for a designer to use the amplitude versus frequency uh, scale because we can look at the individual harmonics and we can see what what the bad guys are. Because there are different ones that are bad. Some of them are not so bad. For example, this one here, which is the tall, tallest one, is actually second harmonic. Second harmonic is music. It's like playing, if you're playing an E, you play the next scale above, you know, just two times. It's no big deal. The third harmonic is a little bit trickier, but it's still music. We, we make it music because you know, our guitars and pianos and everything, we have to make things kind of fit together so they don't, they're not dissonant. But as we go up the scale, we've got fourth, which is kind of a strange number, a strange thing for this little guy. But then we got fifth. Now, fifth is the scare, starts to be the scary tone. When we see fifth harmonic, we say it's okay for, to, for a little bit. 
And actually, that is a little bit because if this guy, you know, I could tell, look at the scale, say tenth of a percent. Well, then that's a hundredth of a percent. I mean, a hundredth of a percent there. And and down here is well, I don't know. It's it's like pretty darn small. Oh, oh, one percent or something like that. And even though this this thing brings it out, the machinery brings it out. It's not a very high level. Remember, this is all logarithmic. This is all compressed so that you can get it all on one screen. If I put it on a linear scale, you wouldn't even see any of this stuff. It would just disappear because it's 100 times, 200 times below like the peak guy here. So now the one that we like to worry about the most and tubes are really good about this is seventh harmonic. Now seventh harmonic is actually, this is five, six, seven. That is actually a little bit worrisome. Just not much worrisome, but it is a little worrisome because seventh harmonic is literally not related to any musical scale that we could normally adjust to, at least on that, you know, in a Western civilization. So we're sort of stuck, you know. Uh, if you have any of that seventh harmonic, it's always going to sound strange. It's probably one of the reasons that solid state sounds the way it does sometimes to people because it it isn't as smooth as tubes now this tube unit you know, has some sevens but it's really really far down i wouldn't worry i mean you know it's it, it's probably acceptable uh to almost every year that normal year now what what is what can we do uh then um we can change the level, like I have one watt. One watt is pretty high level. That's that, uh, if you have a reasonably efficient speaker, I just typically efficient speaker, you get maybe almost 90 dB of SPL. Now, 90 dB is pretty loud. If you really get down, you measure with a with a, with your own little volt meter, like, you know, sound level meter. You find that, uh, that's fairly loud. Now, it's not Grateful Dead loud, but it is loud compared to, you know, just sitting back and listening to music. And of course, that's the average. But the peaks could still go much higher than that. So if you're playing a large orchestra, you might need 110 dB for all I know. But who knows? So anyway, let's go on from there. So that I'm going to now change this thing a little bit. I'm going to start changing the settings a little bit show you what happens if I go up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my input level again, which is here. See, it's at the end of the scale. And I'm going to change the scale by three times. It's a little over three times. So it's 10 dB. Okay. And then I have to change this scale by three times. And you can see that it comes out almost exactly the same. But that's 10 volts out, not three. And you can see the level here it went up. And I have to scale that down. I can't even do it. I have to leave it that way. I'm at the end of my scale. I'll just say. And you can see that then I'm going to look at the distortion. And the distortion is way off scale. So it means that I have to click this scale, these, 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 these sensitivity scales. And this shows me the distortion. Again, we see the distortion. And then we see what it the amount is actually, in this case, it's a lot. Well, this is about 10 watts out. It's maybe 10, 12, 15 watts out. Not, not, not much, but loud enough. Loud, loud by comparison. But it's getting close to the limits of the amplifier. The amplifier is only like 30 watts, 35 watts. So, um, and it, it's showing um, about 1.75 percent. I mean, it's three quarters of a percent of distortion. Now, that's pretty high by solid state uh, and the latest amplifier specs. This is really high. But it does get to show you. And you can see when I push this button what the distortions look like. You can see that they're different. They, didn't, they don't look like the old ones. They have a different uh, kind of settings. You could see that. This one here is the second harmonic is low now. It used to be dominant. It used to sit right on top. 
The third harmonic has gone up. That's expected. And then the fifth harmonic's gone up too. Look at that. See, it's getting closer. It's about 10 times away from the, uh, in other words, it's about one tenth third harmonic. Now that's getting up there. And then this is the worst. I mean, this is uh, the seventh harmonic. And you can see that uh, I'm, I'm a little scared now, <laughs> actually. Well, I don't know about this little amplifier right now. I'm, I'm, you know, it's okay, but it's not great. It, the seventh harmonic is showing its face. And that is a scary one. That's the scary distortion. Now, I can't go any higher. I could go lower. And of course, this thing at a tenth of a watt, which I could double click and so forth, get down to. If I do that, click, click. And then I go click, 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 click. I mean, I'm down with NASA now. And the signal is still there, but look how smooth it is. It is really smooth. It is really pretty because it's way, 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 way down. This is actually where we nominally kind of miss, listen softly to music. Because if you use this amplifier and listen to the music softly, reasonably, you know, where you've got, a, but, you know, not trying to play hi-fi. This is, th this is just easy music, easy listening. And look at this, the seventh is gone. There's a little tiny bit of fifth. The, sec the, the second's not too bad. No, that's not even the second. Here's the second, and here's the third. And you can see the second is up again compared to the third. The second harmonic is invariably balance. We didn't bother matching these tubes. These tubes came with the unit and we didn't change them out. We didn't, uh, and they, the balance is probably on the tubes is not exactly perfect, but it doesn't really matter that much to the human ear. It just, uh, but the, the distortion is way down. The distortion is about a thousand of a percent. And that's pretty darn low, especially since it doesn't have any higher order stuff. So this guy's not bad for quiet listening. For higher levels, though, if you're playing a little bit of rock and roll, this thing would start to sound a little stressed. So not, it's not perfect. So John, what, what uh, parts of the amplifier contribute to the distortion? Well, in this case, I don't know. Uh, it's a combination of the output transformers, which are these, and tubes, output tubes usually. And of course, the, the actual tubes that are the driver tubes too. But the, we've tested all the driver tubes and everything, and they're, they're up to snuff. The output tubes are too. So all we can say is whatever this little amplifier was designed to do, it's pretty much doing it. It just uh, isn't... Uh, uh, generally speaking, this kind of distortion is generated on the output, which is the output transformer and the output tubes. That's 90% of it. Because the voltage swings are so much greater. Now, we can switch over to an other amplifier here. I have a big JC1. Uh, Sorry, John, we have one other quick question. Are these sure. e EL38? EL34s. Their standard EL34s made by, uh, I didn't put the really super tubes in here. Electroharmonics. Electroharmonics. They, they actually came with the unit. And I, I haven't changed them out for Siemens or something like that, which are probably better. Uh, the input tubes, that is another question. And it looks like it's 12 AU7s and 12 AX7s. Right. There's one of each per channel. This is actually a little... This is actually kind of a preamp amp. It has its own volume control and all that. Now, if I go to uh, this big power amp, so now I'm going to turn this guy off. I don't know what else to tell you about this unless there's another question. Does anybody have any questions? Well, in order to overcome that and get, have, to have the amp working within its best parameters, wouldn't it be best to have really efficient speakers? Well, so if you can keep really the water efficient, you wouldn't want to use this little amplifier. <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't want an 80 dB or 82 dB kind of uh, speaker. It's not designed for it. It was never designed for that kind of thing. It would like 90 something dB probably at least. 
but 88 would be all right. Uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that where this thing was designed or Ford is designed for, uh, and similar products like the old Marantz tube stuff was very much like this. Okay. Same power, same altitude, same everything. I've got two more, a couple more questions. Yes, go ahead. Uh, the first is uh, Fred Stanky asks. Uh, do tube testers ever check for distortion or do I need to install them to see what their distortion may be? I don't, they never, what they measure is usually internal shorts. That's the worst case, of course. You know, gassy, you know, the tubes are gassy or shorted. That's where you want it. Like, remember we used to have to repair our TVs, you know, and the old TVs have to come in and plug it on the tube tester. You were really looking for either shorts or just it ran out of gas. In other words, it runs out of gain. What they do is they have a thing called transconductance. Transconductance is voltage in times current is current out. So a volt in will give you, let's say 10 milliamps out, or it'll or one volt in will give you 100 milliamps out. The, the difference, that is what's called the transconductance of the tube. Now, as the tubes age, they lose their transconductance. He just wastes away, wears away, you might say. And that's one of the reasons that weak tubes often sound so much better when you place new tubes in that they say, oh, wow, you know, it's perky now. <laughs> you know, it's not sloggy. Mm -hmm. Well, that's because transconductance is up. And the, But when it comes to absolute linearity, it's really tricky. Different tubes, even of the same model numbers, can measure differently, especially different brands. I've seen some Russian tubes that really measured lousy, and I was shocked. I said, what in the heck could even, and I asked people who were experts, and they said, well, the reason is it's probably because it, uh, uh, the, the construction of the of the tube internally is such that they're trying to get a little bit more power out of it or something, and they're willing to sacrifice the distortion. Now, the EL34, which is this one here, the one where you have here, that's an awfully good tube. Uh, that is, was, was designed in World War II by the Germans uh, for, as an FM transmitting tube for their fighter plane of all things, but it wound up being a good audio tube too. <laughs> so old telephone or whoever, you know, originally made it, that's what they, that's what they did it for. And that, but guess what, Marantz, no, these were the greatest. Marantz two people, they always use these tubes. Maybe not this brand, but they use the same model tube. They never even went to the great big guys. They just, just stay with it. They, they need more power, they just put two of, I mean, two more in parallel. Like the Marantz 9 was actually four of these tubes in one channel. I don't like this thing, but you know. Yeah. So next question is, how old is the tube amp? I'm... This one's fairly new. This was made in China, and it's a copy of like the old Marantz type stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's made as a kind of a, a cover. Gotcha. Not as uh, the state of the art or anything. Um, and uh, it was reviewed in Stereophile. And that is one of the things you can actually find this thing. It's called a K and uh, K Y I N. And Stereophile actually tested this thing extensively and said, eh, not a bad little unit. <laughs> and uh, they got very much the same. Um, in fact, if I could, I don't know if we can get that from under you, but I uh, just this one piece of paper. We can show you this piece of paper. Look at that. Remember, if you remember the old old thing, this is exact. The, I didn't do this. Stereophile did this. That, those are their measurements. They're measuring the same thing on the scope screens as I am. They're showing the waveform distortion, and they're showing the original, the actual output right on top of each other. And then here are all the spectrum. Look at all the spectrum stuff. Woo. Worse than mine. Worse than what I made. Now, so real, real quick, uh, this will be. These are the last ones. Yes, yes. Um, uh, 
what is the uh, topology of the amplifier? Uh, SRPP and long tail face splitter? Question mark. Who knows? Okay. And uh, and are the EL thirty fours triode wired? Not in this case. They're ultra linear right now. They actually do both, but I don't have the controller to show you that the differences are. I would show you, but I have a remote control that can switch between one and the other. To be honest with you, the amount of distortion is about the same, but the triode is always a little smoother sound. Probably that seventh harmonic would be a little bit low down more. It's probably the difference. Now, I'm going to try to turn this thing on. I've got to make sure I'm down. Uh, I think I'm okay. Now, I, I have to set the levels again because this is a new power, it's a different power amp. And it's gain, it's actual voltage gain, you know, from input to output is different than this little guy. Okay, here it clicked on. You can see that the input level is now set out or it's come up. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to three volts and I'm going to set this thing to about where it was before. And John, what amplifier is that so people know? A JC1, JC1 plus, uh, you know, state of the day. And here we have the distortion and you can't hardly see anything. The reason you can't hardly see anything is because it's buried in noise. See how it's buried. You know, what are you gonna do with that? You got a number over here, but the number is mostly noise. And when I go to the spectrum analyzer, that's the same thing. You can see the noise, but see how it's reduced, the noise is going away. That's due to the fact that what I'm doing is I'm averaging the signal that's in real time here, but I'm taking like snapshots now. I've set it right now for 10 snapshots. However, if I want to, I can go deeper than that. Uh, it won't be that much different now, but, it, but if I average and I, I have a little control here and I say, I want a hundred averages, it takes a minute or so, but what it'll do, it, it'll start, and see, it'll get better and better and better and better, but it'll be a kind of a, mm, toward the end, it won't it'll sort of keep out. It won't do much better than that. Now, what am I seeing? And I'm going to tell you what I'm seeing. First of all, I'm seeing um, the uh, 1000 cycle. That's the test tone. That's the second harmonic. And that's the third harmonic. And that's the fourth harmonic. And that's the sixth harmonic. It actually is a little tiny, tiny bit of sixth harmonic. No seventh. Nothing. Now, remember, it's only at a watt. That's the old listening place, you know, that we were before. Now, this is a big amp, a watt. I mean, man, that's easy. Right? So let's go to let's go to something else. Let's go to uh, ten watts. So I set my input level again, and I have to do a couple of clicks. Click here, click here, and I'm looking at. This is about ten volts out now. It's, uh, you can start to see real distortion starting to appear. So instead of being really driven hard, the distortion is starting to, the, it's getting above the noise, but it's still down in the mud. It's actually at the residual of my analyzer. This analyzer is a good analyzer for its time, but it's four years old. And the later analyzers are actually a lot more sensitive to the that thing, that distortion. But the problem with them is they're not in real time. This is a real time analyzer and it doesn't have a computer, it doesn't have to compute, it doesn't have to do anything like that. So what I, I get what it what it is at the moment. And when I'm working, it's a lot easier to work with a machine like this. But you can see that it's pretty darn good. Uh, here is the second harmonic and the third. They're almost the same height. And then there's a little tiny bit of other things. 
and those little tiny bit of other things may or may not be part of the analyzer. Because the analyzer has its own distortion. So let's go, and I'm gonna have to turn on a big fan here. That that's the cool the heat sink. Because you know, if we want to get let's say more, we've got 10 volts out now. Now I'm gonna go to 30 volts. That's loud, man. I mean that's that's really pushing it. I can't even see it on this. I have to take this off the screen. I didn't plan for this one. And you can see some real distortion. You can actually see the real distortion, and, and and this will actually show up here. Now we're starting to see whole spread of things. Now, how much is that? That that is about point oh oh three five percent distortion. You know, one percent, a tenth of a percent, a hundred of a percent, three thousandth of a percent pretty small, but of course the equipment is revealing. Here's the equipment showing me what it is. Now, that's a little spooky now. Now I got some sevens and I have to worry about that. Now, if I look at it, I say, well, it's not that bad. It's it's like a minus 120 dB down or something like that. I say, well, can I hear that? I don't know, but it shows you that even a big power amplifier like this is never perfect. It's just you know, effortless at listening levels. But on the peaks, it will start showing some distortion. Now there are, there is equipment out there that are measurement oriented. In other words, the designs are measurement oriented. When you make something that's measurement oriented, it winds up being good measuring, but ne not necessarily good sound. And that's partly because of the way that they lowered the distortion. And for some reason, and we don't know exactly why all the time, that stuff can sound okay or it can sound lousy. And yet we don't know exactly why. Anyway, this is 30 volts out. That's, that's pushing it. That's, that's uh, uh, 100 watts. So... Uh, and I'm not going to go any farther. I was thinking to do a lot more, or somewhat more. There's no point in it. It's just a bird away, blown up. I've got a big load resistor in the back, and I got an air fan on it. But you know, after a while, this will blow your speaker out too. Hey, uh, yeah, John. Going. We yes. have another another question. The model numbers of the HP distortion analyzer and spectrum analyzer. Okay, this is a HP 339, uh, the, the main unit here. And it is a nice unit because it is reliable. When they made these things, they made them reliable. The unit above, if you can, I don't know if you can see that. Can you see the big guy on the, uh, it actually has more features than uh, HP, that big, big guy. But that doesn't, doesn't hardly work. It fails with time, not amount of damage or, or abuse, time, cheaper parts, <laughs> I guess. But it's a sad thing because that was a very nice unit. It just, uh, and it competed with this unit, but they, they all fell by the wayside. I think people have, they say, I got three of those things in the back, but none of them work. It's the kind of thing that happens. And I've got three or four of them in the back here too, and they don't work. And, uh, but uh, that's the 339. Now this one is not, is really, I happen to own it. And I like it because it's a very powerful little machine. Well, not little machine, it's a big machine. It was the biggest guy of its time, but that was 40 years ago. And uh, it is uh, not all that perfect, except that it does do the waveforms, like the spectrum, like we're seeing here rather nicely, rather clearly, and I like it for that. 
but that's this is called an HP thirty five sixty three or, or HP thirty five sixty two is the more common one, and these things retail retail at about twenty seven thousand bucks, you know, back in the day, and now they're worth a couple of thousand if you got a good one, and uh, they uh, they're not any yeah, a couple of hundred if you're taking a chance. They don't whether they work or not. They may not work. Um, anyway, that, that's the deal. So um, now we're going to have to drop this thing down here. A couple other questions for you. Sure. Do you have a means to measure transient intermodulation distortion? Not on this machine. Not on this one. And it doesn't really matter to me. For me, I don't need to know it because I know the nature of the beast and uh, I can measure the slew rate and, and pretty much predict the, the transient in mod. There are exotic kinds of distortion that are measurable. And I have a machine in the other room, which we're not uh, doing today, which is, you know, it's a hundred times more sensitive than this combination. And it is, does transient modulation distortion actually almost from a push button measurement, but it's a bear to actually do a demo with because it takes forever to set it up to do a test. And when you set it up for a test, it's a half hour's gone by. And you guys are sitting out there wondering what the heck is he doing? What is the machine doing? And, but when do, people are doing deeper, deeper research, they, they do that, they'll wait that half hour hour, whatever it takes. That's one of the problems with better equipment or the newer equipment, I should say, is that it might be more sensitive, but it's a bear to get efficiently, uh, to get an efficient like estimation of the signal, of, of what it is, of, of the distortion. When we want to estimate the quality of a machine, it does, this kind of equipment will do the job and it'll also do it for repair and all that to make sure it's up, it's working properly. Uh, for high quality, the highest quality um, testing, this is not good enough. You know, this stuff is not good enough. As you see, it's, it's hard at listening levels. It's hard to measure anything. If I, uh, on this, this thing, big amp. So I could just guess, well, I guess it's okay there. <laughs> Where I have to worry mostly is higher up, you know, so that the transition is, uh, uh, as it gets louder and louder, it doesn't start to sound more. I'm so pretty one, sure. Okay, what? Go ahead. One more question is, um, do you consider how warm the equipment is or how the equipment performs over time? So I think we're getting at, it. Does, should it be warmed up before you test? And, and what, uh, how well, does that Well, it depends on the equipment. This little tube amp actually, interestingly enough, when I first turned it on cold earlier today before, just to make sure it was working properly and it's plugged in right. It had a bigger number that I was used to. I was a little surprised. I said, gee, since yesterday or the day before, it's gone up a little, you know, what, what, did the tube go bad or something? But as time went on and the tube started warming up, it settled down. But with this big power amp, I didn't have it on at all until I decided to turn it on. So in the first five minutes, I'm testing it and it's doing its job within the first five minutes of, of turning on. Now, does that mean that it's gonna sound as good an hour later? It probably will sound better an hour later, but we don't know exactly why. This test equipment will not show us why. It just, it just, uh, it, 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 it's one of those mysteries. Like, why should you leave your equipment on? Why should you warm stuff up? But I do know it makes a difference. It's one of the mysteries that we don't really have an answer to. Turn this down. I guess you notice the difference in the level. 
that thing is uh, only used on the worst case. And uh, you know, I was a melt, I'd, normal power resistor, I'd just blow it up. I'd just, you know, just think of putting 100 watts into the, into the resistor. And that just, it just helped doing that. So um, I don't know what else. Is there something else I can say? Uh, I just uh, wanted to show you guys that and show you that this waveform again, this waveform here, this wobbly waveform, is is often in every every stereo file. I mean, when you see a measurement of an amplifier or preamp, you usually see that particular like it looks like that. Guess what? You can just look at it and see how smooth or how ugly it is. Like if it's got little prickles on it, little spiky things, you know, along these things. If it looks like the Teton Mountains or something, you know, the, or the Alps, you know, up and down, up and down, and up and down, spiky, you know, kind of thing. That means it's gonna have a lot of higher order distortion and it's not gonna sound as good. This little tube amp actually shows it's pretty smooth. This picture shows it's smooth. And what I saw on the screen showed it was pretty smooth. And of course, this app is pretty smooth too, of course. But a, a much more power. In other words, this one has at least 10 times the power that this guy has. So, you know, it, it can run higher. You can run 30 volts instead of three and get roughly the same kind of results. In fact, it even does better. Well, okay. Um, uh, one more question, and then sure. if you want, we can open it up for folks to ask you directly if you want. Sure. Uh, this question is from John Earl. How does pre-driver bias affect the distortion characteristic? I don't know what that exactly means. Seems that what it means is that the driver of an output stage, like a big power amp like this, it needs a driver stage, which is directly in, in front of it, of course. And what it does, it's a slightly smaller output device, pair of output devices usually, which drives the outputs, the, the main output. Sometimes, in fact, this is one of the weaknesses of some designs, people don't bias the driver stage to be class A at all times. There's no good reason why they shouldn't. They just think, oh, well, you know, I'm a class AB amplifier anyway. A class AB driver will be okay and then I'll be probably 10 degrees cooler or two degrees cooler overall in the amplifier. Well, no, it's better to run your driver's class A. And if that's what tree bias means, then that would be what it is. If it means something else, I don't know. There, there are some automatic kind of things where they try to change the bias and the auto bias and all that. I, I'm not doing anything like that. This thing, this amplifier is really just classic, comparatively speaking, on its output stage. It's just brute force. It, it doesn't have any tricks. And it works pretty well because subjectively, I've found that that's the best way to do it. It doesn't necessarily measure perfectly, but it measures well enough. And uh, it listens even better than it measures. Some people have actually complained about some of my amps. They said, well, you know, if we want to live with an amp that has some distortion, their John Curl's thing sounds okay. You know, that's what they'll say. Yeah, but what what is the measurement matter? What when does it matter? It matters to the ear whether you you, you can hear it hear the A lot of times these people go into marath measurement marathons that don't mean very much. And uh, Unfortunately, they're looking at the wrong stuff and also the wrong distortion. There are different kinds of distortion. This is simple harmonic distortion. This is the simplest test. This is a single tone, period. 
just the tone. And that tone is uh, basically just a single, you know, like a thousand cycles, you know. And it is not music. It's hard to characterize a measurement and then as mu like music would be and measure it accurately. We need something that's repeatable and understandable already, definable. That's why we use like this. But back 80 years ago, more than 80 years ago, they said harmonic distortion, as like tested by this machine, can fool you. They knew back in the two days, on only the two days, that a THD measurement of below in those days it wasn't 0.01, which is here. It was 10 times higher. It was like a tenth of a percent. He said, well, you know, it should be perfectly okay. Well, it depends. If it's seventh harmonic, I'll promise you it isn't any good. If it's second harmonic, maybe you can live with it. We, we, we've been doing it forever. So there's that. Okay. Any other I bet there are. Has there been any thought to using a like a white noise or pink noise or something like that as opposed to a single cycle or does that not work? No, uh, back in 1977 or so, Madi Otula with another guy, his name is Lanolin, uh, wrote a paper which they published in the Audio Engineering Society they gave the paper, I don't know if I ever got it in the, man, in the book, but it, I sent it to another designer, a young designer is coming up because he didn't know about it. I mean, it was done before he was born. So, and in their case, they said correlation of amplifier distortion measurements. They had IM, they had TIM, they had harmonic, they had two-tone. Uh, 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 CCIF and SIMPTI, they're, they're, they're different types of these things. And they add noise insertion tests. There is, was a test made in, by the Brits, which is basically a white noise test. And you put white noise in. And what you do is you actually create a notch in the white noise so that there's nothing there in the white noise. So let's say the white noise goes up to 10,000 cycles and then starts again at 15,000, but between 10 and 15,000, there's nothing, let's just say. Then the receiving equipment on the other end looks only between 10 and 15,000 and sees what's been added there. It shouldn't be there. Now, most of the time, the noises kind of correlate. In other words, they, they one you've got high IM, you got some high, you got some harmonic, and you got some uh, other kind. Uh, TIM is a little bit different; it'll it'll come on with some amplifiers more than others. But interestingly enough, this noise insertion test only came out with certain power amplifiers. In other words, it became really, really obvious and deviant almost. And they tested a power amp, and it happened to be a quad. Remember the quad amplifiers? It's one of them. And it measured, the noise test went crazy. Why? I'm not exactly sure. I don't think they knew exactly why, but they published it. They didn't say it was a quad. They told me it was a quad. That's why I know. But they just said, this amplifier has complex feedback system. Yes, it does. That's why it even measures a good at all, you know, nominally. Like on this test equipment, it'll measure fine. Noise insertion test, they said, test terrible. Most equipment like this wouldn't make any difference. Noise insertion would be conform to all the other distortion because it's a fate. Oh, I'm sorry. Whoops. No uh, problem. No problem. We're good. And uh, the, uh, it would, it, but it, it has been done and it's been forgotten by many, many people. And uh, a lot of the test equipment does, don't even bother. Even the latest stuff, the stuff that's the most expensive, they don't seem to bother with the distortion of the, of, of all the different kinds of distortion they could measure. 
they they just say, well, nobody's bothering us about it. We'll just, you know, give you the harmonic distortion and we'll keep lowering the level instead of it being this is like a minus 100 machine. I said, well, we'll give you 140. Minus 140. Well, what is that? That's a, that means it's 100 times lower distortion than this was ever designed to be. Good. But does it tell you anything useful? I don't think so very often. Only under research, like let's say you want to measure a resistor or a capacitor, mm -hmm. a single component, then that extra 100 times, you know, sensitivity can really bring something out that would not be brought out. But for a whole amplifier, generally speaking, it doesn't make any difference. You go much below 100 here. 100 is already, you know, below like listening. I mean, it's just, you're never going to hear it. The, the noise in the room will just cover every, you know, it's the so you, room. Of you, did, you did talk a little bit about um, amps measuring well, but maybe not sounding great. Is that attributable, at least in part, or could be to the amount of feedback? Uh, often, feed, feedback is often used, yes. The feedback itself is what we call a bandwidth. It fixes something that needs to be fixed. If you didn't have any distortion in the first place, you wouldn't need any feedback. So, and then how much feedback you use when it comes to audio. This is audio, not, not precision machinery or anything. From an audio point of view, it is there just to get the levels below a certain percentage point. In other words, the open loop might measure 1%. And a closed loop, when you might measure a thousand of a percent. What does that mean? Well, that, if it was 1% initially and it's a thousand of a percent, it means you have 60 dB of feedback. That's what it literally means. And it looks great on test equipment like this with repeating um, signals. Now, the, the the parasound has a minimum amount of feedback, comparatively speaking. We don't, I don't strive to put more feedback, more gain, forward gain, or more feedback in it than absolutely necessary. But it still has to look respectable or else nobody will buy it, you know, even if it sounded just as good. There are guys like Charlie Hansen of Air, who was now passed away, but Charlie decided that he was going to build a power up just like this or something like this. And he would uh, not use any feedback at all. And the distortion, when you measured it, the stereo file would measure it, it would be off the scale. You know, even though it was the best amplifier he could make, but he refused to use negative feedback. And I think he went too far because if you go too far and don't use any feedback and you need the feedback, the distortion will become so high, just open loop, that you'll hear it as just a regular distortion, you know, as, as, as you know, something's wrong. It's muddled or it's, it's not clear or I hear something I shouldn't hear. But, you know, the human ear is pretty tolerant of several, like several percent distortion. It really is. That, or if it wasn't so sensitive, I mean, insensitive to lower order distortion, like the second and the third, we would never have been able to use analog tape. Even from the get-go, all those recording, analog recordings, it all sound like heck because they all have up to 10% distortion on the peaks, maybe 20%, maybe more on the peaks. On the average, they have maybe a half percent or a third of a percent. Just a little bit. Da, 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 da. And then the peak comes up and it's 10% and then back, back. That is normal. That's, that's typical. And it sounds wonderful. You say, well, man, kind of blue sounds pretty good to me. You know, yeah. See, guess what? The reason that it's so high is that negative, there is no negative feedback in the magnetic tape system. It runs open loop. So whatever the tape has, you get. You can't fix it. Here's a but question. It, Here's a question I missed. Uh, 
in order to see the distortion waveform is the fundamental being removed by filtering or subtraction? It's being nulled out by, I don't know what to say, uh, the difference between subtracting. They don't really subtract it. They just, they null it. They actually have, what they do is they have a wide band kind of, you know, pathway and then they say at that frequency no <laughs> and they actually have a kind of a not notch bridge which no you know the signal comes in and it knows itself that frequency knows itself it's it's like it works on subtraction at the filter level and that's where they get this uh 100 db like this machine has a 100 db filter It'll take a hundred dB. That's out. That's one hundred thousand. So it'll it'll reduce the just uh, it'll reduce the original test tone a hundred thousand times. That's what it does for a living. But that's all it will do. It won't. It, yeah. And um, uh, it, it actually right here I can see where uh, wherever this residual was before. I, I haven't changed the machinery, so it's locked into from a previous me measurement. And it is not really, really, really off the scale, but that's 100,000 times down from the original test time. So, you know, it's not much. And the human ear after a while gives up. But when it's out, when you have the distortion out in the outer regions out here, that's when, boy, I'll tell you, it doesn't take much. And you could, the ear seems to pick it up and says, you know, it kind of sounds a little edgy and so forth and so on. And um, almost all commercial equipment has a significant amount of higher order distortion. It's one of the reasons we buy high fly equipment. Consumer stuff is pretty marginal because they don't want to, they don't want to bust their tails to build something really great. These things cost money, they're heavy, they're Here's a question from Sam. In an amp like the JC1, how do you go about component selection for output stage and drivers? Well, um, yeah, go ahead. To say it's 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 experience and and uh, and uh, example. You know, before the unit becomes available to the public, we test like a different driver. Let's say we, we say, we wanted to see, we, we're having trouble getting the drivers that we had, let's say 10 years before, they stopped making them or something. So we have to find a new driver. Then we'll go out, we'll, we'll make a test, you know, test equivalent. I mean, take one of these amps or something just like it. We call it a breadboard or, a, a, you know, and we basically test a different kind of front end, a different set of output device, I mean, driver devices, let's say. And generally speaking, we find the right ones that work the best. They're usually designed for audio in the first place by the Japanese or, or by the Americans. And they, they, they work okay. We just know which ones work better by experience. And we, we talk to each other as engineers say, hey, what do you think about the blah, blah, blah. I say, yeah, that one's a good one, man. I tested it and it works better than the other thing, you know, usually. So that's how it's done. And, you know, in a parasound, we use an idealized kind of design. We use FETs, complementary power FETs, running class A, running a whole lot of bipolar output pairs. We have 12 output pairs on this thing. This is a one channel thing, it's one mono channel. And it's got 12 output pairs, but it's driven by one output pair of virtually the same kind of power capability as one of the uh, 12 output devices. So it, but it's complementary FET. And it's a comp, it's a FETs are running as smooth and as clean as I can make it. So they, they're giving the baby in the output stage, the, the output stage, hey, here, here's the signal, 
we've cleaned it all up. We got giving you lots of current drive. We're giving you everything that you need to do your job. That's what it does. So this thing, this amplifier here, the JC1 Plus, they're really designed for difficult loads, like uh, two ohm loads, four ohm loads. Eight ohms is kind of a joke for this thing. You know, it just you do it. It's kind of like a sports car on the freeway. You know? Yeah, I don't do it. Uh, but it's, it's so what? You know, who needs to drive a Porsche in the Bay Shore? You know, I mean, it's it might be fun, but uh, a lot of other cars will do just as well. It's just the back, the hills in the back, you know, behind, behind the, you know, five miles from the freeway. There, you know, there's where the Porsche will come on, do its thing, give you a difference. Your family car will barely get it, so, you know, itself across the mountain range. So uh, another question uh, from John says, do you have any opinions about the new gallium nitride transistor class D amps that are coming to market? I think that the parts are, are superior. They are a true improvement over the previous parts. And they are what we do these days, what people do to make a better and better part. Class D amplification that's been around for, since I know, it's been almost 70 years, 65 years, let's say. Uh, I don't want to exaggerate too much to say 65. 65, see, no, uh, uh, no, I have to say 55 years, let's say 55 years. For 55 years ago, the first Class D amplifier, commercial amplifier made by a company called Sinclair in England, they came out with a five watt switching amp. It was so bad that they stopped making it because of this, and it went back to conventional design. Things have improved since then. And then they tried in the 1970s. So that was 1965. Within about 10 years, we started making them again. They're trying to make them again. And they again had problems. And then they tried in the late 80s and the, and the 90s, they tried switching in. And they and they they had their again the output devices, especially the switching devices, just didn't switch fast enough. And they had all kinds of extra distortions. And they just didn't look that good. And today, with this new stuff that they have, they can do pretty darn good. And probably competitive to anything like this big amp here, if, if you couldn't live with whatever the sound it gives. Class D still has its limitations. But it, it, you know, it is overhyped, guys. Trust me. The sales force is out there telling you, this is it. We've got the greatest thing since can melt, man. You know, blah, 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 blah. And that's nonsense. That's just sales stuff. So, but a class D amp, a good class D amp could be as good as or competitive with something like this great big beast here, you know. 80 pound beast for one channel and you can carry it under your arm maybe. Yeah, it's even better but not all that you want cherry? Yep. Oh. on <laughs> well there's a follow-up question uh, from Sam which is are there guidelines for circuit layout or is it all trial and error well, uh, we copy each other. <laughs> I mean, it really comes down to it. Um, back in the day, we started out with a very primitive kind of design. And that design has developed over a period of years. Back in the middle 60s, late 60s, very simple designs were made 
they they could be as low as let's say realistically eight transistors two outputs two drivers one uh one input and one uh, second stage. The input in the second stage did all the board swinging and developing everything. And the output would just give you the change the current. And that was the original amplifier that everybody used. It was capacitor coupled in. It had a single power supply, like a plus and minus, but not even plus and minus. It's the plus, uh, let's say 40 volt power supply or 60 volt power supply. And it had capacitors on the input and capacitors on the output. And, and they said, this is the state of the art, folks. And uh, it wasn't very good, really. But it, that's what they had. Now, back in the late 60s, that's when I came in. And I wasn't the only one. There was another guy who's passed away. At least I think he's gone. Um, and his name was John Iverson. We independently came up with what we call the complementary differential. We were looking for a better way of making an input stage and a drive stage than the original original, which only took two devices. Remember, input stage device and second stage. But when we had the complementary differential, we found that we got other advantages. We could DC couple, we didn't need coupling gaps. We found out that we had a much better drive capability for the second stage. So we could actually have a push-pull drive instead of a single-ended drive. So the second stage where a lot of the distortion was generated. And we found that um, it was possible to do it. The people around me, and I used to work in the Ampex audio department when I developed my version of it. They thought I was crazy. I mean, I offered it to them. They didn't want it. They said, it's too complex, man. We don't need that. You know, man, we're, we're good with what we got the one I just originally described to you. So they'd make a little model, mo mo little amplifier. Remember, they were, make, they were making tape recorders primarily, but we had to have a little amplifier for, you know, listening in for mo mo uh, monitoring our, our recordings. And we used to use a little vacuum tube guy with a couple of 6 V6s. I don't know if they're smaller tubes than this. And they sounded wonderful. But when we went to replace them solid state, we made a piece of junk. And they found out it was a piece of junk. They really did. But hey, they didn't know any better. You're all imagining things. Anyway, the complementary differential today is just about everywhere. You know, it's it's like it isn't every everywhere, but it's almost everywhere. But I used uh, I started in 1968, and that was my my baby. But you know what? I couldn't beat vacuum tube triode amps. A, an amplifier like this little guy here in triode, I don't know if somebody's about the one about it. It's just uh, your, your, is that yours? That's yours. Uh, the, the, I gotta stop doing that because I'm rattling this thing around. Um, the, the amplifier like this in triode mode would beat my stuff, even complementary differential back in 1968. I know because I tried AB testing, you know, really, and my goodness, like I wasn't there yet. And yet the measurements, this equipment somewhere in this in a way, couldn't tell me why. It was just something more. TIM was one of the tricks. My tube, I mean, my transistor amplifier was very stable, but very slow. And I found that to be so, and I didn't even realize it. I had actually made the darn thing slow, tried to make it as stable uh, with a capacitive or difficult load as possible. And I gave it so much headroom that way that I slowed the amplifier down so that it actually created its own TIM. That's what I found out. It took me a couple of years to figure this out. Well, for, for people who may not know, what is TIM? Well, transient intermodulation distortion is just a term. It is the distortion that's created by uh, having a, a very fast rise time inside a test, I mean, a, uh, an audio like musical signal. 
like let's say you hit a, a drum drum like a cymbal or a, or or a drum drum eh, drum head or anything that has a very fast rise time, very fast change, very fast. What happens is that it overloads the amplifier's input stage. It, it congests there, you might say. It just gets caught in there and it can't get out. And for but with a normal tone, like we're doing these test tones, it's a breeze with the same amplifier. Mm -hmm. But when you go to TIM, so what we have is what we call a different kind of test. And the TIM test is rather complex and I don't have it here. It's a sign, what we call a sine square test. The uh, normal um, harmonic test, if we go instead of 1,000 cycles, if we test at 50,000 cycles, for example, 20 to 50,000, and we actually look at this, uh, this is a lamp that's not going to actually TIM very much, but if we look at a solid state amp, we can see if one's going to have TIM or not, just with a sine wave. We don't really need uh, a special TIM test, except for kind of calibration of what the distortion is. And that, that we can't, we can't fix um, uh, without, without t t testing the design. The designs have slowly, oh, it took a long time. The guys started out, oh, we don't believe in any of it. And then they started quietly fixing it. And now most everything is TIM free. Most uh, of it. We've got a few more questions. Um, one from Fred, did you try to patent complementary differential stages? What about it? Did you try to patent that? I didn't because in theory, since I worked at Ampex, Ampex would have owned it. And I, I rationalized this at the time by saying, look, I developed this on my own, on my spare time. And I didn't do it for Ampex. I did it for me. But technically, I was working for Ampex. So theoretically, they could have said, well, John. So I offered it to them. I said, here, you want this? They said, no, we don't. Now, it happened on two separate occasions where I offered uh, that uh, to, for them to learn, you know, take the complementary differential and do something with it. And, then, and both times he said, it's too complex. Yeah. We don't want to bother. And it isn't so complex now. Yeah. But like a lot of things, you know, you get, you get used to it. Say, oh, yeah, well, that's what, the way it is. They, uh, there's kind of a, a, another question from Dennis that's aligned with that. So, John, do you, you still use compromise? complementary differential FET inputs in the JC1. Yes. But can you explain the choice to use MOSFET, MOSFET source followers to drive the bank of BJT outputs? I don't understand that question. No, okay. Maybe uh, Dennis can hop on and clarify his question. I mean, we use complementary differential FET inputs. And remember that the FET inputs, the FETs we use are called a special kind of FET. They're not the regular MOSFETs. They're not MOSFETs at all. They're JFETs. JFETs are a completely different animal than MOSFETs, except in their, like, their principle of operation is about the same. But they're their, the way they're biased and the way they behave and their quietness and all that, it's completely different. The, the JFETs that we use, we have to get these JFETs. We, Parasound has been very lucky. They, they got a lot of these things got when they could. When they could. They got them. But we're not alone. Fast Labs has them. Uh, other companies have them too. And uh, Constellation, a company I used to work with uh, a lot, they have a, their own JFETs. They they smart, you know, when, when they, they were easily available, they got a, a large stock of them. They had to invest in them. It's like investment. 
Now, a lot of people didn't invest in these things. So today, if I had to go to somebody and say, well, how about uh, using JFEST? They wouldn't say, well, I don't know where to get any. And, and amateurs have it one heck of a time trying to get to complimentary mm -hmm. JFEST. It's almost impossible. The, the big manufacturers often won't sell it to them because they're too small of, of um, you know, of a customer. They don't, they want to sell to the, to the, uh, whatever they can make or whatever they want to sell to uh, a customer by the thousands or something. Yeah. They don't, they don't want to bother with the guy who wants a dozen or something. That's a sad thing, but it's true. So I can't really commend that. You know, my, my type of designs require a JPEG, complementary JPEG, matched. All has to be matched together too. Four devices have to be matched to each other. To do it right. But when you get it right, then it is pretty darn linear. And oh. that's the get go, linear from the get go, you might say. That, that helps and fast. It, it, it gives me a lot of, a lot of speed. So it, you know, I developed this stuff not for any particular company at the time, the, the JFED version. So I was left on unemployment. <laughs> yeah. So Rich, Richard says he can add some perspective on the GAN FET. If Richard wants to jump on. Who's which, which Richard? Well, um, actually, I wanted to praise, I wanted to praise John. Um, the, the FETs that he's talking about um, are decades old. Uh, and at the time that they were current, the Toshibu was making them. Uh, they were about 15 cents a piece, um, plus or minus. And at some point, they decided to discontinue them. Maybe the, maybe the market wasn't large enough for them. And sadly, and I got this information from John also, um, they, they trashed the, <laughs> they just trashed everything that could have made it any, anybody possible to ever make this thing. The, the dyes were just, that was the end of it. So uh, there was one big stash, um, and this goes back a long, long time, of somebody who was very smart to buy a lot of them, and John made that uh, John made that uh, known to me. And so, to give you an idea of how much we value these parts, um, well, first of all, ninety nine percent of what people say um, are Chinese fakes. Um, and we've been through a whole lot of them just to see, you know, one's more outrageous than the next. But to give you an idea of how important these FETs are to us, um, in the last year, we've spent $235,000 on acquiring these FETs for the uh, long-term uh, integrity of the amps that, uh, the amps that use them. Um, and uh, and there's very there's very few people that know who and where. Uh, John, of course, uh, knows, and uh, Nelson Pass knows. Uh, but it's this is really this is it's it's really <laughs> it's a shame that they, 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 they didn't you know they couldn't keep making them, and someday they'll be gone, and there will be something you know something else. But I don't think that anything will ever outdo these particular uh, these particular JFETs. Uh, but it's, it's well, a yeah, big investment, and most companies wouldn't do it. Yeah, Richard, it's a very much like vacuum tubes. You know, back in the day, yeah. Telefunken and Siemens made some really great vacuum tubes. Everybody knows it. Try to get them, you know. They cost a fortune. Who, who can afford them? Right. I was offered some the other day. My goodness, they were way up there in price. What are they, Gregor? You know? Remember what for for like twelve x sevens? You're for Telefunken's or Muller or Muller's or something like that. No, you're talking one hundred and fifty dollars a piece. And how about the the Siemens? I've seen oh Siemens. Uh, I know that Anthony has a stash, and I think they're. I want to say they're one hundred and fifty dollars a piece. Of course, you want to get match quads of it, so there's six hundred dollars for yeah six hundred dollars, folks, for, for four this of little them. pair of mm -hmm. these, these little bunch of tubes. Think about it. And at the same time, where a competing Russian tube would be, you know, prior to prior to the, the invasion, you were getting them for $25, $30 a piece. After the invasion, you're probably looking at twice that. 
yeah, there, it, it's the same kind of problem. And it's sad, but it, it is what it is. We, we have to, we've, heard, we've searched the world, Richard especially, to find enough vets to do the job. We were very lucky that we were able to get a source of these vets. I have my own source of vets myself, personal source, because I, when I uh, realized that I, I needed vets, I just got them by the hundreds to, and you know, now I have a couple thousand of them, you know, but the reason is, is because I, I got them when they were cheap, you know, not when they were super expensive. Now I theoretically could charge $25 a piece for some of these darn things, you know, which I got for, let's say a dollar. Well, okay, that's good enough for me, I guess, you know, if somebody wants to pay that price, but uh, I don't just, I'm not into sell fats or anything. It's just, that's what happens just like with tubes. All right, uh, another question from, uh, this is from Jay, would you discuss voltage versus current feedback and how it affects an amp's bandwidth and sound? I can't do that. Uh, that uh, the, the difference between the two is subtle. Uh, the, the real difference between voltage and current feedback is actually the presence of a sense resistor, which is the emitter resistor usually, or the source resistor on the input and it's connected to ground and, 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 and basically it is part of the circuitry uh, and it, it, uh, that turns it into current feedback uh, with this uh, uh, a slightly modified um, input stage. Uh, you get uh, the ability to have uh, current feedback uh, the difference in quality, I, I think it's, it's a toss-up. I usually use voltage feedback, and uh, I have designs that actually do everything, but uh, current and voltage feedback. But it is normal. The parasounds here, they're all voltage feedback. They have to be. By their nature, they have to be. I couldn't use the complementary differential input stage exactly as it is with current feedback, for example. So I don't use it that way. So that, if that makes any sense to you. Um, so that's the best I could say. Those are subtle things that, what we really worry about and what really, really is important is open loop bandwidth. That's the bandwidth you can't measure easily. You have to predict it or or do special test conditions because it's without negative feedback. Without negative feedback, you have to look at where the, the it'll have a really, really, really high gain, like this amplifier here, have a really, really high gain until about a couple of thousand cycles, and then it'll start to roll off at 60 dB per octave. It has to roll off. It invariably has to roll off because it will os oscillate if it doesn't. And it, and it has to roll off a lot before it, uh, before a certain critical zone where there's too much phase shift or the darn thing will turn into an oscillator. And so we're stuck with that. And the higher the open loop bandwidth, all else being equal, the better it usually sounds. There are new techniques today that I haven't even used that could theoretically raise the open loop bandwidth 10 times over what we have today. But uh, I, I'm not using them, that technique. It's exotic. And it probably is prone to instability with difficult loads. That's another thing that that, uh, that type of exotic stability uh, or comp well, exotic compensation, advanced compensation. It's multi-capacitor kind of, you know, different capacitors in different places and you know, calculated in different ways that, uh, creates this uh, roll off instead of a very simple 60 dB per octave roll off, which is just, you know, a capacitor and a resistor basically for all practical purposes. And um, so we tend to avoid, avoid it. Um, but open loop bandwidth, all else being equal, is probably more important than almost anything else that's not 
measured today properly. That's a great predictor, like an integrated circuit, what it's going to sound like. And uh, a lot of uh, a lot of op amp, high quality uh, analog circuits, uh, they they measure great on this equipment. Measure great, but they are not as good as the other device devices that may not quite measure as good, but have a wider open of bandwidth by let's say a hundred times more for audio or video. Interestingly enough, video amplifiers often sound better than audio amplifiers, all else being equal in audio. Because the video guys have to worry about certain things that the audio guys don't have to worry about. And they they design around that. And they they can compromise the static distortion for the dynamic distortion, you might say. Not TIM, but what we call FIM. And uh, instead of TIM, we call it FIM or PIM. And, and, it, and, and that is a different kind of distortion. And it's not measured on this test equipment. This test equipment is blind to that distortion. It has to be predicted almost. Very special test equipment is required to measure. One more question from Jay. Do you consider closed loop bandwidth greater than 50,000 hertz to be important? Up to a certain degree, I do. Uh, if it isn't, then your open loop bandwidth is going to be really, really lousy. Let's say you have 20 dB of feedback, just 20 dB. If you have 20 dB of feedback and you're rolling off for 50,000 cycles, it generally implies that your open loop bandwidth is only 5,000 cycles. But let's say you have 40 dB of feedback, that's more typical. Then the, it becomes, um, the, you, the open loop bandwidth is only 500 cycles. You see, it goes like times 100. You know, 40 dB is 100. You take that and, and you look at your gain back, I mean, you know, it's your, open, your closed loop bandwidth divided by, by 100. You got to get 500. What about 60 or 60 dB of feedback? That's very typical. Uh, then you go to um, 50 cycles, open loop bandwidth. And then even above that, you get five cycles. Well, guess what? It's going to cause problems that you cannot easily measure with this equipment. It will not show up with this test equipment that I'm using here today, but it will be there. And it's the thing that we fight people all the time in the uh, engine, audio engineering society, for example. They just don't want to believe it. They think we're a bunch of cranks, you see. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, high fly, what is that? You know? It's sad, but it's true. That's how they, they look at us. All right, uh, Richard has says he has some insights about the GAN FET. Um, yeah, let me mute myself. Okay, you can hear me. Um, yeah. This is an interest. This is an interesting time. Um, the GAN the, the GANs basically um, were were prom promulgated by a guy named Skip Taylor, who was an engineer at a company called. D2 audio, and I think that uh, this goes back to about 2009, uh, and he was talking about all the things that it could do, um, and it didn't really go very far at that point. Nobody really understood it, and then Bruno picked up on it, and he's really, 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 really very clever, um, and it's probably, as, as John said, it's really, really good. Um, I don't think it's as good as the best that John can do. But the thing that I, the thing that concerns me is that as good as it is to, I, to identify their own <laughs> place in the world, every manufacturer is going to look for a way to uh, improve on the GAN, on the GAN FET. And most of that is already, uh, already evidencing in the fact that people are um, putting other, other, pro other products uh, in series. Um, with the with the uh, the they actually believe that it's going to make it sound better, and this is going to be a real big mess. 
um, as these things get uh, more and more around. And so one of the issues is that issue. It's going to be a lot of confusion and virtually all of these things, as far as I can tell, are only going to make the sound worse. Uh, the second item is, is a commercial one, speaking as a manufacturer. Um, how does a brand separate its product? Let's say it's Genfit, Genfit based. What do you do uh, to make your product uh, better and more and more attractive to people than anybody else? And I think this is going to create a real mess when I go back to like, well, they're going to do this and they're going to do that. Um, and I think uh, none of us, I don't think any of us are going to have much of a interest in the Genfit, but as looking forward, I think it's going to turn out to be very, very confusing for people. The other thing is I have a, a kind of con confidential uh, information uh, from Ice Power and regarding uh, regarding GAN and uh, I'll send I'll, I'll there's nothing in there that, that shouldn't be seen. So I'll I'll send that um, I'll send that over there so it, uh, it can be di disseminated amongst the uh, the group. I'm done. Good, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Richard. And I'm going to say something. I'm going to be a objective here so that we make sure it's all covered and nobody, you know, Bruno is one of the best designers in the world. Uh, he, um, and I don't necessarily get along, but, uh, but he makes a good switching amp. And he's made some really great switching amps in his time. He is extremely advanced in his design and he loves negative feedback. But guess what? I am told that he also likes high open loop gain, uh, high open loop frequency. High open loop frequency at the same time. So he's actually following the rules that I set, aside, set down, even though he doesn't want to admit to it. He say, well, feedback is wonderful. I use all kinds of feedback, yeah, but he uses it in a special way where he has the open loop bandwidth higher than the audio frequency range. Higher than mine, usually. Higher than the ones that I can make in these amps, which are more conventional in their design. And uh, I know one designer who has one of those uh, Bruno-based amps, and he says it's one of the best amps in the world. But he likes my amp, too. So there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that and he likes his own amps. He works for a different company. And he he knows that within the limits of, of what Bruno can do, he's doing a really good job. But switching fits have their limits, just like everything else. This has this power app has limits too. I can't make one that you can carry under your arm. Wish I could. And you know, it would be as powerful and could sound as good. Wish it could be done, but it can't. So Dennis has a, I guess it's a clarifying point on his previous question. Uh, and I'm gonna have to go back to his previous one question and I'll read the follow-up. So the previous question is, uh, you had already confirmed that you use complimentary JFET inputs on the JC1. And they says, but can you explain the, cho the choice you, to use MOSFET source followers to drive the bank of BJT? Oh. Outputs. Well, yeah, there's a very good reason for using. First of all, why use FETs at all? Okay, FETs, FETs. Why use MOSFETs? Well, MOSFETs are power FETs. MOSFETs are available. You can buy them. They used to have a, a device called a VFET. The VFET is a really interesting part, but they're not available anymore. They've been obsolete for 40 years. Not by me. <laughs> I still have some in a drawer. They're kind of cool. But they just don't, they stopped making them. It, it, it's a Japanese thing. You know, the Japanese are interesting that way. They'll build something for a long time. They'll even advertise it and get you really interested in it. And then they'll pull the production. If it doesn't work out, then it's economically viable for them. Mm. In other words, if they can't get enough yield, it's usually yield in their product line. So that, let's say they make a die of a thousand and only a hundred come out working. They, they can't, the, the yield is not good enough for them to continue. It costs too much to make the original uh, die thing, you know, the master die. 
So they don't do it. They actually just pull the plug. They'll pull the plug like they pulled the plug on me back in 1975 with uh, VFS. I, I designed whole amplifiers around it. And guess what? We couldn't get them. And, and, and the other ones, the MOSFETs weren't even available yet. Not the power MOSFETs that we know today. No. They were just becoming available. So uh, the, 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 the thing is the MOSFETs, why use MOSFETs instead of bipolar transistors? If that is the question, bipolar transistors are, have a finite input impedance. It's finite. And remember, they're driving into a difficult load, the 12 parallel pairs of output devices. And they are like a little amplifier with a follower and they need a very high input impedance. And guess what? A MOSFET gives you that free. You get, it's just there. It never changes. Oh, you got some capacitance and stuff, but and nonlinear too as well, but you don't get a change of the dynamic resistance depending on what load you have on the amplifier. When you have an amplifier and you have a resistive load, like we're testing here, just an eight ohm or four ohm resistor I could do or 16, whatever. What do I get? I, I, I have a, just a resistor, but a loudspeaker is not a resistor. A loudspeaker changes from two ohms to 10 ohms to, you know, then back to five ohms and then on and on and on, all through the audio spectrum. And dynamically when it's playing, sometimes the cone is going in a forward direction and then it's being told by the, the amplifier to turn reverse direction. It can't re re reverse direction that quickly, not really. So it, it'll put out its own garbage, which then goes through the feedback loop and everything. Now, the thing is, when you want a consistent amplifier, an amplifier that handles almost any load, the FET inputs present a constant resistance to the driver stage. The driver stage is well is before it's like smaller signal devices. That's where all the voltage swing for the entire amp is generated. In the JC1, we actually use a completely separate power supply for the driver stage. It literally has its own preamp. I mean, it's its own regulators and its own uh, 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 transformer, power transformer, everything. You know, and, and that's one of the things that costs money when you buy these things. We've gone to that extent. But guess what? It operates and it doesn't care what kind of load it sees because it all it sees is a couple of MOSFETs sitting out, out there. And it says, oh, well, I can deal with that. So the driver stage never gets modulated. But guess what? On a normal amplifier with the tr bipolar transistors, the mod, the, the op let's say the impedance goes from 10 ohms to 2 ohms dynamically, which you can do very easily. Uh, at all times, you know, just while you're playing music. Well, the actual gain of the amplifier is bouncing up and down too. The open loop gain of the amplifier is bouncing up and down. Well, it can't bounce up and down with this design because it's blocked by that MOSFET barrier, that wall. The, the, it, the, it's just a metal plate. It says, hey, you know, you know, you can put your voltage on my metal plate and I'll do what I want with it. But it, it doesn't uh, reflect back and say, well, I'm going to drive. I need more current if I'm going to do what I'm doing now. It, the beta is infinity, not 100 or whatever, 50 or 10 or whatever. Because under stressful situations, that's why some amplifiers can drive difficult loads at almost effortlessly, where other ones, they seem to measure okay, and then they, they kind of fall apart when you have a difficult load. Put an easy yeah. load on them and maybe, you know, single speaker or something, you know, might be just fine. Is that enough? Does everybody understand? I think that's been great, John. We've gone quite a bit over, but um, 
Uh, I don't know. Let's take one or two more questions, and then I think we can call it a, an afternoon. This has been fascinating. Uh, Dennis says, thanks, John. Makes perfect sense. The power MOSFET drives the output BG, BJTs, best of both worlds, then driven by independent driver stage with different power supplies. Good design. Uh, any <laughs> other questions from folks? Uh, Fred Stanky has has one, uh, uh, which is when you talk about feedback, do you mean global feedback? So open loop uh, means I can still use the large emitter resistors to get local feedback? Question mark. Let's say that is it's a matter of which is worse. Actually, interestingly enough, all feedback has its problems. Local and loop, we call global, mm -hmm. but global is always worse. Okay, it has other uh, time-related things because it's more complex and it has more phase shift associated with it. Local feedback is just, it actually usually makes the phase shift lower. Like if you have an input device and then you put an emitter resistor in, you actually improve the, the phase shift of the device and, and the gain and the input impedance and everything. Even though the feedback itself is causing subtle problems that most people don't understand that you have to it's a uh, uh, uh like it's a uh, uh senior course in in engineering to to, to before they reveal it to you hmm. say by the way guys you know what negative feedback does even local feedback and they can prove to you you can actually have distortions canceling out and you can have distortions being you know one distortion, second harmonic will turn into third, certain proportion, and fifth will turn to seventh, and so forth and so on. It's not so good. That's even with the local feedback, it'll happen. With loop, it's even worse. There are other problems, dynamic, you know, TIM and all that. You, with local feedback, you don't get any extra TIM or anything like that. You just get this kick up of the harmonic series. The harmonic series, which is second and third mostly, We'll start, you'll start seeing fifths, sevenths, and ninths that were invisible before. Well, what happened? Where did they come from? You know, like, well, they were generated by the local feedback. And you say, but it's no loop. I know, but it's there anyway. It's a mathematical thing. It just, it happens. Hey, John. Because, yeah. yep. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Hey, uh, years from now, how would you like to be, what would you like to be remembered for? Like if you were looking back at yourself, how would you describe yourself? I don't know. <laughs> Jeez, I mean, uh, a guru, you know, I don't know. A guru, yeah, well, that's a good answer. Uh, you, know, you know what somebody did? Somebody in China, it was actually from, uh, not mainland China, but uh, in uh, Taiwan, they came up with a, a name for me. And they said I was a circuit chef. Okay, that's a good one. I was a top circuit chef. <laughs> that's that great. Okay. Better than anything that I could think of. I'll remember that. That's what I do. I, I make certain recipes. My circuits are like recipes. Mm -hmm. I say, follow the recipe. Do not change your cookie. You know, you want the right cookie, you know, you know keep, keep with it. Don't try to use artificial sugar where you real sugar, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. That's so uh, here, here's another question. Um, any thoughts about using Sanken FETs in, in the output section in, in a Class A fully uh, complementary design? We do, I think. <laughs> it, uh, I don't know. Richard, if he's still on, he could tell me one way or the other. I don't know. Don't we use uh, Sankens already? Is Richard gone? I think he's still on there. He's on. Richard, you're muted. There you okay. Are. I no? hear you. Did yep. you hear the question, Richard? No, I, I did hear the question. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, this is a matter of commerce. Uh, Sankin, um, which are, uh, are wonderful parts, John steered us the right way, are discontinuing parts um, left and right. And... Uh, I don't know that they're going to be committed to 
making the same kind of parts uh, in the future. And we're already having to, to ante up to uh, get our hands on a lot of them, but the exact ones that we use um, are um, probably not going to be around for very long. And I, it's, it's, <laughs> it's really stressful because these, I don't think there's anything that's quite as good as these and nobody wants to move backwards. So anyway, that's my speech about Sankin. Thank you, Richard. You know, no, we do our best. Parasound it does its best to use the best parts available for the job. And, you know, people, we fight tooth and nail. I mean, I'm not saying me. I mean, Parasound does it. They tell me what they've had to do. They go through great effort to get the right parts. They don't try to get a cheaper, uh, like, you know, sort of work part. There are certain things, you know, especially like fake fake transistors, you know, the fake effects, fake JFETs, for example. Some of those things actually work. They just don't work as well as the originals, that's all. Same thing with fake transistors. They probably work. They just don't work as well as the Sankin that they, they say they are. And that's part of what we have to put up with. We're always putting up with stuff like that. And we're always testing uh, what we get mm. in, see if it's for real. Oh, there's there's a follow-up. They, they were actually referring to Sankin RET, uh, ring emitter transistors. Oh, all, all of the devices we use are pretty much RETs. In other words, they, they if I got it right, I think our transistors, the ones we use, are very, very fast. They're like 40 megacycles, 60 megacycles, and not like two megacycles or four megacycles like, like they used to be when we used to get them from Motorola. Mm -hmm. An R8 ring emitter transistor is designed to be really fast. And that is, they got that F sub T, which is the, the game bad, that's the limit of what trying to get anything through. The beta drops down to one when you get to 60 megahertz, okay? That's what it means. And guess what? It's so much better. It's like, geez, 60, it's like 30 times better than it used to be. And we use that as an advantage in all our designs. Yeah, we, you know, that's one of the reasons we can make decent designs, but we've had that for many years. Um, the Sankin wasn't the one that actually invented it. Uh, it was another company, a Japanese company, hmm. who did it first. And I built an amplifier in 1981 that was faster than this amplifier. It was faster, but it didn't sound as good because I had to use output inductors and things that I needed for stability. Actually, I realized that maybe getting rid of the output inductors was worth it. And I actually slowed down the amp a little bit. This amp could be a thousand volts per microsecond if I wanted to make an instrument amp out of it instead of an audio amp. I could make it 10 times faster, but it wouldn't be as good sonically. It would just do its job, you know, uh, faster. Okay, the, the next question was, was Japan <laughs> that just came up. We're a Sankin. Where is it? Oh, it's a Japan. Japanese company. Thank you, Richard. But you know, these parts are not the only parts. There are other parts available that people can use, but they don't seem to use them very often. They're rather expensive. There are MOSFETs that, uh, uh, amplifiers that uh, are devices that um, are, are, are used by other manufacturers that, that are pretty darn good. And all MOSFET amplifier is quite possible and practical. They have, but the, the, our combination works very, very well for what we want it to do. And that's to drive difficult loads. And uh, economically, actually, comparatively speaking. It does a pretty good job of that. Those output devices, the what Sankins, what we use, they're rugged and they're, they're powerful enough and linear enough. And uh, so we have 12 of them in parallel, we have 12 sets, 24 devices in this darn thing, you know, all working together just for one output. You know, that's, that's like a 24 cylinder engine or something. It's kind of wow. outrageous, you know, but that's what we need for that effortlessness. Very good.
Well, I think this was very enlightening and uh, a great presentation, John. We really appreciate it, um, spending your time. And I know we, we also enjoy it when you join us on our Friday night happy hours, too. That's always great. <coughs> yeah, as long as I shut up for the first hour. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, th thank you for doing this, John. And Richard, thank you for coming on as well. It was gr it's great that you were able to join as well. Yeah, and, and thank you. Any time that any time that John's around, I always learn something. So that's got value <laughs> too. Uh, he's watching over. He's just making sure I don't slip. Tell him, tell the world, but just stop. Oh. Oh. You guys are a great team, and hopefully, we'll get you both in person again. And Gregory, thank you for being such a good videographer. Well, appreciate thank you. It. <laughs> Holding it still, we appreciate it all. Yeah. Okay, and thanks everybody Art for joining. Always. Thank you very much. Right. It, was, it was fun. And yeah, and if you missed any of this, it's going to be on uh, YouTube, so you can watch it again and again at your leisure. Have a good night. We'll... All right, thanks, thanks everyone. All. Thank, Thank you, guys. Take care. Bye.